Hey, 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 it's your girl, Go Queen, with the Q Chat Podcast. Thank you for tuning in to our latest episode. Before we get started, I want to give you some information on how you can grab some Q Chat merchandise. Go to www.goqueen.com and there you can purchase any Q Chat merchandise or any of my Go Love Yourself tees. So go ahead, take a look at the website, and feel free to grab some merchandise today. There's something else I want to fill you guys in on. If you haven't heard, Anchor is the hottest and easiest way to make a podcast. It's the best price in the world free. So go ahead and download the free Anchor app or go to anchor.fm to get started. And just remember, Anchor distributes your podcast to all streaming platforms. It's super simple. So go ahead and sit back and get ready to listen to the next episode of the Q Chat. But don't forget, go to www.goqueen.com and grab some merchandise. Thank you for tuning in and get ready to listen in. Go Queen! Hey, so we're recording a new episode of the Q Chat, and today is a really important one. Um, if anyone has listened to any of my past episodes or just looked at my social media page, um, they know that I'm very big on utilizing the right to vote. So right now I have a awesome trailblazer. Her name is Miss Christian Richardson Jordan, and she's a third generation Harlem Knight from the wonderful state of New York. And I want to give her the floor to introduce herself. She's running for a very important seat on the New York City Council District 9 for Central Harlem in 2021. And if she gets elected, she'll be the first Black lesbian on the New York City Council. So this is huge, guys. So I want to go ahead and give Ms. Christian um, the floor so she can introduce herself and give everyone her background and her political journey. How are you doing today, Ms. Christian? I'm great. Thank you for the platform and for, for just having me on today. I really appreciate it. I, um, I want to say for folks that, that uh, I have, I've had an interesting journey. You know, I, <laughs> I've had a, a journey where I was so fed up with politics that I, um, I really had, had sworn off of being involved in much of any way. Um, I did go vote because I had promised my great aunt that I would, and she was part of the fight to get us the right to vote. But I was very disenchanted with electoral politics into, until very recently, where I just uh, have, have started to realize that we need to be the change, you know, if we want to see these things. And um, in my community of Harlem, New York, uh, we have some of the highest incarceration rates in the city. The community is over-policed. The community is criminalized. And uh, we also have high rates of, of poverty and homelessness that need to be addressed. The trash pickup in this district is not as often as trash pickup in districts downtown. Uh, we, there's, there's just a lot of discrepancies and uh, straight up white supremacy that has, mm. to, that has to be addressed. So I, I uh, got in the race uh, to, to make a difference, you know, and um, I, I'm hoping for support. So for anyone listening, if you're in the Harlem area or even if you're not in the Harlem area, but you just want to support the cause, there's, there's plenty of go going on with this campaign. Wow, that is amazing. And I'm glad that you pointed out how, you know, you realize the problems in your community. And like you mentioned, you want it to be the change. And I think that's all it takes sometimes for us, just like even right now, matter of fact, this is a perfect, perfect example, just the protest. You know, we're tired, we're fed up, and people are protesting, and they're having their voices heard, and it's making a difference. You know, it's taking some time, of course. I mean, as we all know, with the situation with Breonna Taylor, you know, yeah, they passed some laws. We still want, we want an arrest and a conviction, quite frankly. Mm -hmm. But, you know, just the fact that people are getting out there and making their voices heard, it does make a difference. So, I know that one of the plant, one of your um, platforms, because I was trying to read up on you, and I have to say, I was like, oh my God, it's so much. I didn't even know where to start. Like, you have such a colorful background, and just you've done a lot, you know, like you've written books as well. And I know there's a por portion on your website, which will make sure that we give everyone that link before we end the conversation. But you took something very important from Zora Neale Hurston, which was that the Black woman is the mule of the world. 
So even with that, I just feel like right now we've shown that voting is important. Have we all utilized it at times? And when I mean we, I mean community, not necessarily. But I know one of the things that took place, you know, for example, when Hillary Clinton was running for office, they notated how many Black women had voted and how they were a good majority of the popular vote that she received. Before we go diving into your platform for Disrupt the District, I just want, if you can just, from your political standpoint, you know, like you notated that a change needs to take place. For anyone that's listening and, you know, they may be riding a fence like, oh, you know, my my vote doesn't matter. It, there's no purpose of me doing this. Can you, from your standpoint, just stress the importance actually of voting, you know, the importance of the Black vote and especially the importance of the vote from Black women? Can you just stress that, you know, for our listeners and give your perspective on the power of voting? Oh, yes, absolutely. I think I think uh, we give our way, we give away our power when we don't vote and mm-hmm. we give away our power when we when we uh, assume that change can't be made because real talk, there are systems of oppression. There absolutely is white supremacy at play. There's patriarchy, there's homophobia. There are all of those things going on. Uh, however, there are also actual people in actual positions of power making actual decisions, policy decisions that affect our day-to-day lives. And when when we get engaged uh, with voting and also with volunteering and also with um, even donations, even like giving some here and there, uh, you have to invest in the changes that you want to see. And now is definitely a moment. There are candidates running who are really about change. There is, uh, I can speak for New York, there is uh, uh, some of the most diversity in the field of city council that we've ever seen. Um, It is a little sad to say that if elected, I would be the first out Black lesbian or first out Black queer woman on New York City Council. I mean, that's you know, that that's sort of a commentary on where we've been in terms right. of diversity. Uh, but there are candidates running like me who really want to see change. And when we look at some of the people who have achieved it, uh, like we look at an AOC or we look at an Ilhan Omar or we look at a Rashid Tlaib, right? Or we mm-hmm. look at Ayanna Presley. Um, that squad that is in the new Kron new Congress, they, that, that they happened because of movement work. It's not Mm. just that one person running, right? It was a collective of people saying, we're going to help make this change happen. We're going to put someone and something different in the seat and someone who holds different ideals and a different perspective in the seat. And it's made all the difference, even just in terms of the conversations that we get to have, even just in terms of the, uh, the actual dialogue and the advocacy work that can then help push policy changes forward and and really shape our communities. Because, you know, we look at something like poverty, right? And I already said, you know, about District 9 and Central Harlem and and rates of homelessness and poverty. Mm -hmm. Um, But New York is home to approximately 1 million millionaires. Mm. There's literally so much money here. It is just a question of where we're distributing and how we're distributing resources. And are we willing to have those who make more give their fair share of what they make in order to help provide the services for those most in need and most oppressed? And those are real decisions that people in power are making. And uh, your vote is actually putting people in places of power to make those decisions. So don't take it lightly. Uh, I always encourage people like do do a little bit of the legwork and um, look at the different websites and try to figure out, you know, really who you're voting for, uh, because it is important. And I like one thing that I just feel like sometimes with voting, I think some people also they just limit their scope to voting for the president. You know, like voting every four years for presidency, you know, and especially, you know, like you said, New York, I'm obviously in Louisiana, you know, I think that's another thing that we also need to broaden our scope, 
because I think sometimes we really truly only look at voting, oh, when it comes to the presidential election or perhaps for the governor or the mayor, but no, like our legislators, you know, like it's all a wheel together. Like we have to definitely think more about voting for legislators, you know, voting for our senators, our councilmen, like all these things, like you mentioned, there's a group of people, you know, that have a say so on the laws that are passed, the legislation, things, you know, that affect us daily. And I think we also just need to think about that more often, too. You know, like it's not all about who's in office as far as in the White House. You know, it all works together. So that's one thing to, you know, I just hope people just even yeah. by listening to this understand that as well. Just like you mentioned, just something as the trash pickup. You know, everything works together. So, you know, I just want people to definitely understand that, too. You know, just like looking at what's the current state of the world now. And, and yeah. police accountability, too. I yes. just have to bring that up because mm-hmm. of Barack Obama said it. He said it in his public statement and he, he hit the nail right on the head. He said the elected officials who matter most in reforming the police departments and the criminal justice system work at the state and local levels. Yes. That, that quote from him. And it is absolutely true. So when it we're is. talking about police accountability and police brutality, that is your local city council person. That is your uh, civilian complaint review board. And whether or not that, what, well, first off, whether or not there is a board and then mm. whether or not they have power to fire and, spend, and suspend police, which is something I'm fighting for here in New York City. Uh, and I really don't understand what the controversy is around it. I mean, we're right. like we're literally talking about the community having the ability to fire and suspend police officers after cases of misconduct, abuse, and even murder, and to not have the police policing themselves, which we have already seen does not work. Correct. So, yeah. It's, it's just, and I, I'm so happy you broke that down because I just had that conversation with someone too. I said, we, in order to quote unquote police the police, it starts from the local level. You know, it's right. what we put in office amongst our community and on the statewide level. And I just think a lot of things with politics too, I think it's just something as simple as going back to civics class. You know, I just think like sometimes, you know, some people aren't really educated on how things work. So maybe that's where some of the confusion comes in. Whenever I get into debates with people on the importance of voting, it's scary. It's disappointing. Mm -hmm. You know, how (laughs) some of us really don't understand how the laws work or just how important voting is. And I get how maybe a, a, a slight portion of it may just be people are disappointed and they're tired, but you can't ever get that tired where you're just not going to do anything because when you don't go into the polls, you basically, like you said, you've given power to the other side who doesn't care about us, who are harming us, who do not care about jobs or health or anything like that. So it's just something that I wish we all would just drive into our mindset more often. So, and like I said, I can go on and on about voting, but I want to get back to. I definitely, your- I definitely think so. <laughs> and I, I, um, I just want to add, it's it's also by design, right? So mm-hmm. some of what we're fighting for with our own liberation and our own self empowerment is to to fight that design. Like they don't want you to know about local politics. Like they don't right. want you to understand how the laws actually work. They don't want that kind of awareness because. Uh, a lot of the establishment politicians would not maintain the power that they have if people were consciously aware of these things. So that's part of of our work in liberating ourselves. Right. And we definitely have to educate ourselves. Just like you mentioned, you notice what was taking place in your community and you're making an effort to make a change. So a lot of times, you know, we need to do more than just post a meme or, you know, or repost a news story. You know, it takes that extra step. Not all of us, of course, are going to run for public seats. But as you mentioned, we can vote, we can donate, we can volunteer, we can make phone calls to our state legislators and say, hey, you know, I have an issue with this particular situation. Or just seek out with your community leaders and see what you can do individually to make a difference. So that's something that, you know, another thing that we all need to keep in mind and like you mentioned it does empower us and it empowers our community our families their future 
So we do have a say so. So that's the thing I think a lot of us just need to get out of that mind frame. And I know things are frustrating and there's a lot of things that take place that aren't fair. But if we go back even to the 60s, you know, we look at the civil rights movement. People took a stand, you know, they risked their lives, they fought, and it's not an easy thing. It doesn't happen overnight, but the importance is you just can never stop. So one great thing when I was looking at your website regarding your campaign, um, you have listed that your platform is to disrupt the district. So I wanted to definitely dive into your whole platform, because I know um, with your Disrupt the District Mm -hmm. campaign, it spells out your beloved Harlem. So I was looking through those points and they're very important. And when I was reading them, I'm like, it it really goes past Harlem. So mm-hmm. I definitely wanted you to go through those points. I know um, the first one, which was H, which was holding the police accountable and abolition, which as we all know, that's what's happening right now. Like we're all frustrated. We're seeing way too many instances now, of the police just going way too far and they're not being held accountable is the problem. You know, and I know I've personally said this, you know, obviously with George Floyd that disgusted the country. But for a lot of people like myself, you know, I'm like, OK, let's go way back. You know, like this yeah. this didn't just happen. So, you know, I didn't want to diminish people's anger, but I still was kind of like, what did you think was happening before George Floyd? Like, this is just, yeah. you know, that's the thing that I wanted more people to absorb like okay please understand if you're if you were disgusted watching the video please understand that this did not just happen like this has been happening for decades so I wanted you to just go ahead and dive into your disrupt the district campaign and the spelling out of Harlem and as I mentioned the first one for H is holding the police accountable and abolition so what is your stance what is your platform you know for your upcoming campaign on the first portion which is the H so the holding police accountable and abolition is is really a two pronged thing, right? So the mm-hmm. first part, holding police accountable, I am advocating for an elected civilian review board. Uh, right now, the review boards in New York City are appointed instead of elected. Uh, so I believe they should be elected by the local community and also these boards right now don't have any power. Now, just to give context to people, the idea behind a civilian complaint review board is that if you experience police misconduct or abuse or an incident incident in the community happens, you can bring that to the board. And it is supposed to be your avenue for uh, getting that harm addressed, right? The police Mm -hmm. violence police misconduct address. But right now, uh, as I said, the boards are appointed instead of elected. So we don't necessarily have the right people on the boards. We don't necessarily have the people who are of and from the community and chosen by the community, right? Mm -hmm. And the other piece of it is they don't have any power. So if you take, um, and, and I appreciate you giving context uh, to these instances because it's not just George Floyd. Right. And, and it definitely is not just Eric Gardner, but if we take the Eric Gardner case that mm-hmm. happened in New York, the, the Civilian Complaint Review Board voted to fire Eric Gardner, but we still had to do mass movement and lobbying efforts, um, I'm sorry, to fire Pantaleo. Mm -hmm. Uh, officer involved in in the killing. Um, And what we still wound up doing a a mass movement to advocate to fire Pantaleo because the board wasn't able to do it. All they could do was recommend it. So what I'm saying is like, it still winds up being the police commissioner who has this, this sort of final say. And so really we're ultimately asking the police to police themselves and that's not enough. So the boards need to have actual fire and suspension power over police. And um, and the other piece of the platform abolition has to do with eradicating this system of oppression, which is policing itself. And, mm. and, and I think, uh, I think with that, we can get into the context of literally cent- centuries of oppression. And I want to say that my Harlem platform and my stance on both police accountability and abolition is something that I crafted a year ago. So it was before Breonna Taylor, Ahmaud Aubrey, mm. George Floyd, 
because already before those cases, there were already way too many names. There was already Amadou Diallo and Sean Bell, and you know, it was already too many. And right. so, so that is, uh, I, I love the new attention to the issue. I hate that it's come about due to great brutality and loss, but I love that there seems to be a growing movement and opportunity for change. Uh, the, 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 the real talk, real stance I have is that we should defund the NYPD and defund police departments ultimately down to zero. And we should f instead fund alternatives to policing such as uh, mental health street teams, counselors, therapists, and teachers. Uh, we also infuse communities with the, the social services and the safety net that helps stem and prevent crime in the first place, right? So I think um, I really have this long-term nonviolent view of the world, uh, which is, is certainly connected to my faith. I'm Christian and Buddhist. It's definitely connected to that. Um, because that ideal it, it is something I believe in us striving for, a nonviolent world, including eradicating the state violence of policing itself. Um, so that is my stance on, on abolition. But, but real talk, pragmatically, we can start with just defunding and demilitarizing the NYPD uh, because the police department has a six billion dollar budget, and um, meanwhile the schools continuously get cut. Right, so every year we're cutting our education, but we're we seem to have plenty of money for the over policing of the communities and really like totally excessive stuff. Totally excessive, you know. Where I'm, I'm, at, I'm at a, a protest march, and we have you know two cops for every protester, and then you have extra people on the roofs, and you have them in riot gear and these armored trucks for peaceful protesters with no weapons, you know? So we're just, we're, we're spending an excessive amount on uh, the policing. Um, so I spent a lot of time on that because the H is big. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the H is big and it's definitely been the most, um, it's been the one attracting most attention right now. Uh, but you did ask about the whole Harlem platform. So I can mm -hmm. talk uh, I could talk about everything. Uh, Perfect. And I know A is affordable housing, but before we get yeah. to affordable housing, I'm so happy that you did bring up the whole defund the police because Kendrick mm -hmm. Sampson, um, this actor from Insecure, he's actually been protesting in Los Angeles. And, you know, the LAPD, of course, is another infamous unit. And that's what they're pushing for out there as well. So I'm glad that you did break down the whole defund the police notion, the organization, because I think a lot of people are kind of, they're not, really clear on exactly what that means but as you mentioned I just feel like that's another thing states have money for what they want to have money for okay <laughs> right. there's no reason that education should still be lacking in 2020 like oh, you know yeah. it is pretty asinine so you know I, I could go on a, on and about that too <laughs> your next point with your whole spell spelling out of Harlem with the disruptor district campaign, which is A, is for affordable housing. So what is your platform on affordable housing? So we really have to address the gentrification that's going on in the neighborhood. And it's, it's certainly nationwide. And we see it in black and brown communities all over the place, you know. Oh, definitely. Um, and it's and it's uh and it's definitely happening here in Harlem, New York. You know, we have a uh, increase in in gentrification, and it's not even to vilify or to or to somehow um, come at new people who are moving in. It's really to attack the policies that are pushing people out, right? So I'm very clear about that because what we have is we don't have enough rent control and rent stabilization laws. We're not regulating the landlords. We're not regulating the developers. I mean, these are capitalist entities that need to be very, very highly regulated. And uh, we need to put total restrictions on things so that rent is not increasing at these totally astronomical rates that people cannot afford. Uh, I also believe in housing as a human right. 
and I believe in housing the homeless as well, which I put under the A, even though uh, what I'm talking about in that case is actually free housing. Uh, and that stance has a lot to do with um, not only having like a deeper moral compass where we, we house the homeless simply because this is how we see our human family and we put everyone in homes because we respect everyone's life and human dignity, but also that we have seen this actually work in other spaces and places such as the state of Utah, where they house their homeless in homes, not shelters. And they actually saw uh, a great increase in outcomes. They saw that those who had mental, oh, sorry. There's a, yeah, that's fine. Um, they saw a great increase in outcomes. They saw that uh, in cases of mental illness that people were seeking out help. They saw an increase in jobs for people who were formerly jobless because folks had the stabilizing factor of a home, right? So mm -hmm. it, it actually, and it actually wound up saving the state money because they wound up spending less on policing and less on emergency medical services because people had homes. So it, it really, um, I think we really have to turn housing on its head in terms of it being uh, not not only just just capitalist because I, I am a democratic socialist so you know I could get into the ills of that <laughs> but even just greed like even just straight up greed you know just like some people making a ton of money while others do not have a place to live it's not acceptable you know. Yes, I, I definitely agree with that. And I know gentrification is definitely taking place in New Orleans. I mean, that's my hometown and so many neighborhoods when I was a child, neighborhoods that you quite frankly wouldn't want to be in after dark. Now it's just unrecognizable in a lot of ways. And, you know, gentrification isn't all of that, but when it gets to the point where it's changing the aesthetic and then on top of that, as you mentioned, certain areas like when I, that I saw as a child and I was like I couldn't afford to live there you know it's just like what right. has happened you know so it just I don't know it just gets more to the point where we have to be more conscious of helping those who do not have I think we've gotten into a thing just in this world where everyone's so comfortable with chasing the next dollar which I don't necessarily right. knock but as you mentioned we still have to look out for those that are left behind like we really shouldn't live in a world where people are, are homeless and living on the street and a lot of those people they do have mental health issues as well are they some of them are veterans that have fought for this country you know and they're homeless or a person should be homeless because you know they lost their job and you know so many of us are living paycheck to paycheck it's just so much you know, that needs to be taken care of in order to help the next person. So, and once again, I think it's all a, a, a ever-changing will. If there's a yeah. lack of education, lack of jobs, okay, that also contributes to crime too. Like it all fits in together, you know? So it's just, you know, if we could all get to the pulse of the situation and just make things slightly better, I think it would just make a difference in just how things are taking place in this country to begin with. So, so this kind of leads into the next one, actually, with the yes, R, which is redistributing yes. wealth. So, yes. so let's yes. go over yes. the whole redistribution of wealth. Yeah, so the, the R in the Harlem platform is, is uh, simply put about redistributing wealth to those most in need and most oppressed. And I felt the need to explicitly state it because sometimes you have people who have progressive policies or even radical policies and they don't talk about where the money is coming from. I fully acknowledge that if I say something like we need to house the homeless, that that then means that some level of money and resources is coming from somewhere to house the homeless. And yes, I am talking explicitly about redistributing wealth from those who have the most in order to uh, create a safety net that is for everybody. And um, and listen, I think what we need to really see and acknowledge is that our current system is based on exploitation. That this uh, that it, it doesn't it's not to necessarily vilify people, but to just understand that uh, this wealth that some folks have did not come in a vacuum. 
uh, that it came from the exploitation. And, you know, really, if we get into it, the legacy and history of slavery and all mm. the labor of slavery that has made this country wealthy and the descendants of slave owners wealthy. Um, so, and has also created the system of white supremacy in the first place, which privileges those who are, you know, closer to white into getting uh, better, higher paying jobs. And so it's really insidious and it's really led to some people having more and some people having less. And the, the, the day we sort of wake up and realize that we will get way more comfortable with things like taxing those who are wealthy and like redistributing that wealth to those who, who really are um, in, in need and are part of our human family and who in a lot of cases have been exploited. So I, I'm really for that. I do identify as a democratic socialist. I understand that, you know, that, that gets scary for people. They're like, oh, she's a socialist. You know, that, <laughs> that's a thing for people. Uh, but I am, I'm, I'm not afraid. And I think that we really need to consider uh, parts of the system now that are not working and, you know, when, when we look at some of the things, when we talk about uh, healthcare for everybody, that's a socialist program. You know, mm -hmm. when, we talk, when we talk about um, uh, like uh, social security, that's a socialist program. You know, we, what we're, when we're talking about redistributing wealth with some of those programs. So what I'm saying is that we need to make those social safety nets bigger and um, yeah, and redistribute. So, the, that's the R. Uh, okay. the, that's the R. Uh, <laughs> the, I know you're uh, L, living longer and living well. Yeah, yeah. The the L is uh, uh, the living, the living longer, living well is um, twofold. It is a care package for Harlem seniors specifically mm -hmm. uh, because our seniors deserve reverence and respect and honor and um, they deserve housing and they deserve resources at their local senior center and uh, specifically I call for filling staffing needs at the local senior centers to make sure that seniors have an advocate because studies show that seniors do better uh, even even more so than income that the mm -hmm. factor that helps seniors uh, do better in all health outcomes is having an advocate, that that is so important. Uh, so for those who don't have that safety net in their family, we need to make sure we're creating that in the community with the local senior centers being properly staffed and having having social workers and advocates who, who can help seniors navigate what is sometimes a really intense and complicated healthcare system, who could help seniors make sure they're receiving senior housing, uh, because there's a lot of bureaucracy and the, the advocacy is needed. So that's the, that's the senior part. The other part of the living longer, living well has to do with gun control. Mm. And I am, uh, I am absolutely for taking away the guns, all mm -hmm. of the guns. I am for completely disarming everybody, uh, including NYPD. Mm. I am, I am, I really think uh, like overall big picture, we have to move towards a nonviolent world. We have to de-escalate, decriminalize the community, disarm, you know? Mm -hmm. uh, so I am I am for, the, to the extent that it's possible, like stronger and stronger uh, gun control legislation and, uh, and, and for just de-escalating and removing the guns from the community. I think definitely gun control is such a, I don't know, it's such a two-sided, like a, it's like the sides I feel with gun control are either hot or cold. <laughs> like people <laughs> are either extremely adamant about having guns or they're extremely adamant about not having it. It's just like, it's either yes or no. Um, but I just feel like gun violence in general, like we just tend to not take it seriously. And I just feel like, you know, of course, now the media is kind of pretty much overwhelmed with what's taking place with the protests and everything. But as we know, prior to 
this situation, the stance was more having a bigger discussion on gun control because we were having all these horrible random acts of violence. So I definitely feel like gun control is a topic or just something that just gets pushed back on the back burner for Mm -hmm. too long you know i just feel i've always been very strong i've always felt strongly about gun control even for both sides i just feel like there needs to be some more legislation involved because even if people do believe in a right to bear arms it shouldn't be that easy is the problem to get these weapons you know they, they end up in the wrong hands so i just think that's you know a conversation that needs to be had more of so that something takes place so i just feel like the wrong people get yeah. the guns more than anything and just like you mentioned even with the police i mean come on <laughs> like they've abused the use of guns on way too many occasions so that's definitely a conversation that i think more people it, it play with and and we have the technology for there to be mechanisms for self-defense and protection that aren't lethal so i think right. that's the conversation we need to start having you know how how do we create um you know things that that are safe and safety precautions but are not lethal right so right. and um and the technology is there i think the gun control the the issue we run into with gun control is that the gun lobby is super super strong the nra has a lot of power and influence because when you nationally poll the nation nationally People feel <laughs> like we should drop the guns. Like it's right. actually a very popular stance. And the people who say, oh, I want to hang on to my gun are actually in the minority. But mm-hmm. what we wind up having is a, a lot of um, money in politics and a lot of, of NRA involvement in politics. And they're a particularly strong lobby. And so that's why I think we struggle to actually get things done in terms of gun control. And I think also just with, and I can't speak for everyone that owns a gun, but just things that are happening now, like I've had definitely more people say, oh, well, it's time to get a gun, you know, but I have heard that too. That's real. (laughs) Right. You know, that's like, that's, that's not my position or stance, but that is definitely a real energy. People are like, listen, I've had people tell me personally. Yeah, I mean, I've had because I'm a single parent, single mother, whatever, and I've had so many people directly ask me now with everything going on, do you own a gun? And I'm like, no, I don't. And their next response is, well, you should get one. <laughs> Look what's happening in the country. And I, the problem is, like you mentioned, as long as police have the guns and they freely are killing people and not being penalized, I just feel like. You know, <laughs> going with this okay right like we have to start there first like let's talk about who we need to take the guns away from first you know i think that would like help way more than you know more people getting guns you know so that's the problem that we have now as far as that like i said i can go on and on about that too (laughs) but um your last two points with the disrupt the district campaign is E and M. So E is for education for all and environment justice. And M is for meaningful change. So I definitely want to hear um, your platform for both of those, especially when environment justice, because I feel like we don't discuss the environment mm-hmm. more. So I definitely um, would love to have you elaborate on those two. Yeah, definitely. The um, So the E is education for all and environmental justice. The, the environmental justice piece has to do with uh, some of what I mentioned before about increasing the trash pickups in the in the neighborhood. Uh, and just, you know, it, it's our community and it should mm-hmm. look nice. And we and, and not only just in terms of looking nice and taking care of the space, uh, but we need to make sure we're recycling. We need to work on local composting because our planet is in dire need. And that is what scientists keep telling us. And that is what, frankly, the youth who are very tuned in and have been marching in the streets about climate justice, that's what they keep telling us, that they want a future. And right now, we have not taken the steps needed to keep the the planet, you know? And it's almost like Mother Earth is just screaming at us to... Mm get it together because um, it's not it's not a guarantee. It's not just a given. You know, we cannot just keep polluting and destroying. We cannot just keep doing it. So 
so what I advocate for is, is uh, like I said, local recycling, composting, uh, to the extent that we can start investing in reusable economy, start decreasing the plastic. Uh, you know, there's there are uh, definitely things we can do locally in the neighborhood to make it happen. Some of that I think is with public health campaign style type of um, leafleting and flyering and sort of, you know, community education and, and sort of, in, you know, pushing people in their personal choices. Uh, and some of that is really systemic and policy driven in terms of, of uh, actually making sure we invest in all the things needed for recycling and composting. And then there is also a local proposal for a New York Green New Deal, uh, which I definitely agree with, which uh, is sort of modeled after AOC's uh, Green New Deal and um, has this, this radical reimagining of energy use, you know, and how we, how we invest in different technology for, for our energy use that is environmentally friendly and give people jobs at the same time while we're doing that. So uh, that one, I, I think realistically may take a minute to get somewhere with it. Mm -hmm. I think we need to start moving in the direction of, of, of real change when it comes to our environment. I think it's, it's often overlooked and I understand that it maybe doesn't feel to people as immediate as say uh, police brutality or uh, housing, uh, but it is, it is definitely going to affect all of us and it already has affected all of us in terms of, of where the planet is going, you know? Um, we see it in weather patterns and we see it in the climate and we see it in, in actual like storms and things that have happened in parts of the globe that, that have been lost because we haven't done the work yet of really uh, addressing the environment. So, so that's definitely part of it. And the other piece of the E is education for all. Mm -hmm. I am uh, I am a teaching artist. So as you mentioned earlier, I'm an author. I've written two books and, and, uh, and I'm a poet, uh, but I also have done teaching for the past 10 years. And uh, part of what motivated me to run amongst other things is just witnessing things with the students and just witnessing how we continue to fail our kids over and mm -hmm. over and over again. So uh, the education for all piece is about that. It's about making sure that every student has access to real full quality education, which really, you know, we pay lip service to it and we talk about youth being the future and we need to put money where our mouth is on that and actually invest in right. the kids. Yeah. You're right, because I think that's the thing. A lot of people, they claim, you know, <laughs> kids are the future, but you're correct. Kids actually get the least amount of, you know, funding. You know, obviously there's nothing for education. Education is still lacking, as I mentioned. Like, why is education still lacking in the year 2020? And not just in particular states, like all across the board. You know, like, why? So much money gets funded in each state on Education is never at the top of the list. Teachers are still grossly underpaid. You know, there's still no after school programs for children. I mean, we still have the debate now on children getting free lunch. And quite frankly, for all kids to get free lunch anyway. But you know, so uh, like that's still a debate nowadays. Just putting funding or just giving what children need just for them because they really. I mean, if you look at it under even in the technical technical sense, children literally are our future. <laughs> like, you know who right. else is going to be taking you these the reins? Like right like they literally are mm -hmm. our future so it's like we need to respect them too you know and value these kids because they really literally are our future and I think if people could just look at it amongst those terms like you know these children are going to be our future doctors lawyers legislators business owners you know you name it like they literally are our future and I just think you know we could just just put it in long terms that simple it would just really help out a lot yeah I completely I know, agree. Uh, 
so I know um, I didn't mean to cut you off. So I know um, with the last thing of um, the last portions of it, you know, obviously with the E and then M. So what M is meaningful change. So my interpretation is if you take all of your points, you know, it will lead, you know, to the meaningful change. So I definitely want to give you the floor to summarize your meaningful change aspect. Yes. So the me the M being meaningful change is um, I, I I mean meaningful change in terms of representation as as you already pointed out at the beginning of this podcast. You know, being a black queer woman and just what that means in terms of having representatives that actually reflect all the differences in diversity in the community and being what would be the first uh, black lesbian on, on New York City Council. And I also, so I mean it in that sort of symbolic change. And then I also mean it in terms of substantive change from all the bullet points in the platform itself. And um, really ultimately radical love, you know, which is the, the full, uh, mantra of the campaign is is disrupt the district with radical love, right? And I think when we start looking at our human family in that way, where we actually we actually say, you know what, I am connected to my neighbor, I am connected to everyone around me and everything around me, I am going to be part of a larger system of change and a whole different world. That that's the meaningful change I'm talking about, and it actually may sound pie in the sky, but it actually looks like concrete policies that I've outlined in the Harlem platform. Like it actually looks like funding education. It actually looks like regulating landlords so people can afford to stay in their homes. You know, it actually looks like an elected civilian review board uh, to, to be in a place of, of radical love where we're holding up everyone's humanity looks like certain things politically and policy wise. And that's the meaningful change that I am fighting for. And I noticed you, um, we, we talked obviously before we started recording. And as I mentioned, you know, my goal with this particular podcast episode is I just want, I'm really looking for the person who is not voting to listen to this. You know, mm. like I want that person you know, to listen and just truly, truly take in everything you said and what we discussed and say, hey, I am going to register to vote, you know, enough is enough and just see how each and every single person on this planet, we play a part in what's taking place right now. And even with the environment, with the police, with the laws that are passed, each of us play a role in that. So that's my personal goal for people that listen to this particular episode. I really, truly hope someone who doesn't vote listens and says, hey, well, you know, they've made some good points. Yes, so absolutely. I want you, before we wrap things up, I want you to mention in your state of New York, when is the last day to register to vote? First off, <laughs> you know, before we um go over um your contact information, but tell everyone you know what's what's the deadline to get registered. Uh, the so so you have to register by end of September. Mm -hmm. I am going to make sure I give you the exact date. Okay. Mm -hmm. Because I definitely want, like I said, I just, I really hope, you know, I'm, it would be in a perfect world, hopefully everyone that listens votes, <laughs> you know, just in case, you know, I really want people that aren't voting or they think, oh, you know, it doesn't make any sense. It's the same people in office just to say, hey, you actually can make a difference. So that's my, I really want people to just take a different look at, you know, people that don't vote just to take a different perspective on how they view everything as far as politics and voting. So I, yes, definitely. Um, so I just wanted to double check because I did not want to give the wrong date, but the official date is September 22nd. So okay. you need to register by September 22nd in order to be able to vote. Uh, we are gonna do some local stuff here in the beginning of September, that's, you know, voter registration drives and things like that. And I'm sure other parts of the country will, will people will be taking that on. Uh, so I definitely encourage folks to, to 
to register if you're not registered already. Um, it is very easy and uh, there are simple ways to do it. And you can go uh, even just to um, vote.org and they have a whole bunch of resources and, and talked and, and can like work you through every step of like registering the vote. Or even if you're not sure if you're registered or you're not sure where you're registered or you need to update your registration or anything like that, um, vote.org has just a whole bunch of like free information. Um, so I wanna put that out there. And, um, and I would encourage folks to please take the time to look and see who's running in your area locally, because as we've talked about, it's not just the president and some of these things that we see day to day in our lives uh, have to do with our local representatives. So right. um, make sure you're, you're doing that. Definitely. And thank you so much for that information. So once again, everyone, this is Kristen Richardson Jordan. She's running for a seat on the New York City Council District 9 in Harlem in 2021. And as she mentioned, if she gets elected, she'll be the first Black lesbian on that seat. And even though, yes, if she gets elected, of course, that's a great thing. But however, as she mentioned, <laughs> We're in year 2020. She, you know, that, that election takes place in 2021. So we really, 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 you know, I just, the fact that she'll be the first in year 2021, it's exciting, but it's also sad. So I just, you know, I just want people to just really just don't be afraid. As I mentioned in one of my posts today, just be bold, be intentional and be a trailblazer, you know, like, you know, she shouldn't be the first, but we definitely want to see her be the first next year. So Kristen, definitely give everyone your contact information on how they can follow you, where they can go to your website to contribute to the campaign, because obviously we do have a lot of listeners, you know, that, that do have some in New York, but some aren't. So just give everyone all your contact information and no matter where they are, how they can support your campaign. Yeah, definitely. I uh, So as, as you said, my name is Kristen Richardson Jordan. I go by KRJ and um, also Kristen for Harlem. And you can find me on all platforms as Kristen for Harlem. Uh, I will spell it out. It's K-R-I-S-T-I-N. So two eyes because my eyes are wide open. Kristen, uh, Kristen for Harlem on on everything. Uh, if you don't live in the district but can make a donation, it is still a huge help. Even like those small, like five, ten dollar donations, even if it's just that, it does go a long way. Um, and if you do live in the district, I would encourage you to get involved. Uh, if you live in New York, I would encourage you to get involved because a lot of what I'm talking about and advocating for are citywide policies. So, uh, you know, you can find all the information, including social media links at kristenforharlem.com. And uh, thank you again for, for having me on this podcast. Thank you. This has been an awesome conversation and I wish you all the luck and all the success. Like I said, I really, if you win, like I said, it, it'll be great, but I wish you weren't the first, you know, but you know, it's better be, it's better than better being the first than to not have that role at all. So we'll look at it that way. So, you know, I'm rooting for you. I definitely hope that next year we can be you know, I can be sending you a celebratory message or <laughs> hopefully the <laughs> pandemic is over. We can even go visit to Harlem. Like, I really, I love what you're doing and the fact that you looked at your community and you noticed some things that needed a change and you took the bravery and the courage and the confidence to go ahead and be a change. So I salute you and thank you so much for being a part of the podcast. Thank you.